every month you can play with us on Nitrogen Sports Poker Room. That sounds pretty fun, right? We've already done it once, and yeah. it was a blast. It was. It was a very small buy-in and a very big guarantee. 0.1 mil of it buy-in, that's like $1.40 as of today. Guarantee was what, $1,400? There yeah. was a huge overlay. They were giving away free money. We hope you were in on that. Yeah, and if you use the link in the description of this video when you sign up for Nitrogen, you can get that free money, and who wouldn't want that? I mean... That sounds pretty good. At the end of every month, we're doing a tournament just like that. Get in there and get you some free money. As Ed McMahon would say, all for you. Al Capone. Dirtbag. Dr. Doom. Don't know who that is. Magneto. That guy's, he bends metal. Thanos! <laughs> and like, Chris Ferguson. Ah, yeah. The bad guys. The guys you love to hate. That's right. Why Chris Ferguson? Why would we include him in this Because list? he stole all our money and ruined poker. Oh, yeah, that's right. Yeah. Yeah, he ruined poker as it, it was in such a great era. Oh, my god. And he gosh. just took it and he ripped it away from us, yeah. took all our money and never paid it back. Isn't Thanks that cool? a lot. Thanks a lot there, Chris. Yeah, anyway, we're going to give him a little airtime for some reason. <laughs> we're going to do a breakdown featuring him and another throwback, Gus Hansen, back before people knew Chris Ferguson was a dirtbag. That is true. This is actually a pretty cool hand. It's 300, 600 blinds. It's a cash game, and it was suggested to us on Twitter by Isaac Carlisle. Now, we're going to break this hand down as we go, so get ready for some Chris Ferguson mean stuff happening. Cool. No. Pass. Hansen gonna play. Ace 10 offsuit. He's gonna limp in. He limps in that position with a wide range of hands. Yeah, we've seen that. Cool. Well, Antonius is going to call. Not oh. suited queen. <laughs> That's the computer hand, queen seven. Okay. Known as the computer hand because it's oh, what's hand considered hand. an average hand. Now, Andrew Feldman, after a couple of limps, you're on the small blind with ace-jack off suit. You know the kind of range that Gus Hansen and, and Patrick Antonius have. Is this a re-raise spot? Well, it's one of two things. Play it tricky and just flat call and see what the flop brings. Or uh, I think you're going to get called if you even if you raise pre-flop. I like what he did. I like just a flat call. He picked option one. He, uh, he just flat called, played it tricky. Well, he's flop top pair. But now he doesn't quite know where he's at because Ferguson has flopped second pair. Antonius has plopped bottom pair. And mm. Gus Hansen with a gut shot straight draw. Yeah, you're right. That's the only problem with this kind of a flop with Andrew Feldman's hand. But as long as the pot stays relatively small, he can stick around. Play a little small ball here? Absolutely. Pot control right here. This is total a pot control hand. Pot is now $7,500. Wouldn't be surprised if we saw a call with a gut shot and middle pair from Chris Ferguson either. Wouldn't, wouldn't be outside of the realm of possibility. Cool. And he's going to call. I thought maybe we might even see a raise there from Ferguson, see if he can take this one away. He's kind of played those sneaky, aggressive plays every once in a while playing for his image. Five of diamonds. Well, it gives Chris Ferguson another gut shot. Yeah, yeah exactly. Normally you'd think that doesn't change anything, but now actually Chris Ferguson with the double gutter can catch a six or a ten. Yeah, that definitely helped Chris's hand. <laughs> a nine will also win it for him. The eight, though. All the eight does is give Gus Hansen a straight. Yeah, this is uh, actually a, a kind of a tricky hand for Gus to play. He gets called by one of the tighter players at the table, and it's an over call. I mean, to me, when Chris Ferguson overcalls, you've you got to be running for the exits, don't you? Yeah, that, that's when you'd start to not like this hand very much. I think, well, I guess Gus is playing power poker, trying to money whip him. Now, he, he, he is in the pot with the, with the two tightest players at the table so far. From what I've seen today, Andrew Feldman and Chris Ferguson, definitely the two tightest players at this table. Yeah, oh, Gus Hansen yeah. is trying to blow them both out of the hand. Wow. Well, and Andrew Feldman folds top pair just like that. And I suspect we might see the same thing from Chris Ferguson, but with two gut shots, that's tough to fold. Well, the interesting thing, Andrew Feldman, he kind of underrepresented his hand by not raising preflop, then didn't bet out, gave the betting lead to Gus Hansen, and allowed himself to get bluffed off the hand. Right now, the action on Chris Ferguson. The pot is $17,400. And he's got a decision to make. It's $7,700 to him. Yeah, I think there's a at least a 70% chance Chris Ferguson's going to call here. I just have a gut feeling that he he has enough outs, even if he doesn't have the best hand right now. Cool. And he well, does call. He is going to call. Now, yeah, what's he going to do? Sure. What's he going to do on the river if he misses? Gus Hansen. 
Gus Hansen. Gus Hansen. Is there a rhyme or reason to most of the things Gus Hansen does in poker? I believe, I'm not sure. I would guess that there is rhyme, but not reason. Because it's easy to rhyme things unless there's the word orange in it. And yeah, maybe he's, purple? He's a big Lorax fan, that's for sure. Yeah, I mean, Dr. Seuss in general, I think. Yeah, so that's why Gus Hansen decides to limp ace 10 off <laughs> for yeah. some reason. This is a cash game with high blinds, 300, 600, and antes, where you get to win a lot more if you raise pre-flop and people fold. And we have a hand that's not really that good to see multi-way flops with. I don't know why we're limping here. I don't know either, but hey, it's Gus. He does things we never understand. This is just one example. Hey, let's see if there are any more in this hand. I think I can think of multiple, yes. All right. So far. Um, yeah. So we go to the flop. Feldman decided not to raise pre-flop, by the way, with the ace jack off, which is a reasonable decision. He's yeah. at the worst place at the table. He could raise, though. That would have been totally fine. Yep. Yeah, he would expect to get called by <laughs> Gus and uh, Patrick almost always and have to be, as Grant's saying, in the worst position in that spot. It's reasonable to check as well. Right, but it's also kind of strange that he continues to play so passively. Yes. When he checks on the flop, I mean, nobody's the aggressor pre-flop. We have top, top. This is a good time to bet, kind of define the hands, thin the field, get some value. I completely agree. It's really surprising he decides to check. It's okay to check. If you check, you have to understand you are deeply underrepping your hand, though, yeah. and then play it accordingly, and I don't know that he does that. I don't know if he does that either. I mean, he folds the turn. He does have Chris Ferguson behind him. At the same point, not much really comes in that should scare him on the turn. Maybe it's just the fact that Gus bets a second time. Maybe, but it's Gus Hansen. He bluffs all the time. We know I this. I mean, well, we certainly know it when we see this hand. Ferguson. What is Gus doing? <laughs> yeah, let's go back to Gus. All right. Forget Andrew Feldman. So I just like picking on Andrew Feldman. Right, of course. <laughs> so on the flop, <laughs> Gus does flop the gut shot, but he's against three opponents, and all of their ranges smash this flop. Yeah. I don't feel like we really have fold equity almost ever here. This is a bad bet, right? I mean, here's the only thing I can come up with, and it ain't good. Okay. Okay, the blinds you would expect if they had something reasonable would bet. We know that's not true because Andrew Feldman somehow checks top top, but as Gus, we wouldn't expect that. I guess. So by betting here, we think we're often going to fold out the blinds because they chose not to bet. And Patrick, if we can just get through Patrick, we're usually going to win this hand either now or on the turn. Yeah, great. That's all let's, I got. Let's attack Patrick Antonius on the button, the player who is clearly better than us, who has a range that completely smashes this board as well. I mean, it looks also, strong. Also, the blinds are still there. It looks strong when we bet into three players. Yeah. I don't know. It's strong nothing. when you open 9-7 off under the gun, but it's not a good idea. Yeah, so no, that's true. What no, you no. got? That's all I got. Um, <laughs> I don't like this bet by Gus. I agree with Grant. He, he should have raised pre, and I think he absolutely should not have bet this flop. But here we are. We're Gus Hansen. It's too late. The chips have been released. At least we have a gut shot. We have a gut shot. That's we got nice. an overcard. By the way, the overcard is good if we hit it. Patrick folds. That's great. We now the overcard have is not good if we hit it. Andrew Feldman has top top. Well, well, I mean good in a different <laughs> way than you mean it, obviously. Like, we feel good that we hit top pair. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Andrew yeah. Feldman's in the hand still. Um, well, he's in the hand only for a little bit, as we know, because the turn comes. It's a five of diamonds, and Gus decides to fire again after both guys this check to him This is even again. crazier. This yes. is even crazier, right? Now, there is maybe a little bit more thought behind this bet than the flop bet, even though it's still pretty crazy, and the thought would be, you would think that a lot of the time, if the blinds had two pair or better, they would have raised on the flop, right? Yeah, I mean, 10-8 is the nuts, and Gus absolutely can have it. Look what he has, yeah. so I guess he could have 10-8 also. But yeah, you'd expect them to raise, especially Chris Ferguson. So the five doesn't usually improve anybody's hand unless they have jack five there on the blinds. They can have jack five. Eight sixes makes a straight. Eight six makes turn. a straight as well. So those are the big worries, but we're not worried about hands that flop super well that can continue easily. And Gus does decide to bet pretty big, so I give him credit for that. However, however, it's just kind of suicidal anyway. These are as um, Who's, who's, is it Robert Williamson doing no, commentary? No, uh, David Tuckman and somebody else. Some other guy, apparently, yeah. not Robert Williamson. Anyway, who Maybe cares? it is Robert Williamson. I think it is. Uh, who, who can remember? Anyway, <laughs> uh, these are the two tightest players at the table. They both chose to call, but they're so tight that actually Andrew Feldman folds top top on the turn to Gus's continuation of his continuation of his original limp. That might be uh, as big of a mistake as Gus's betting pattern so far. I don't know if it's as big, but it's definitely a mistake. It's pretty big against Gus Hansen. Now, if this was a different player, if it was Johnny Chan, maybe you can make the argument for folding here, but when Gus Hansen bets twice and Chris Ferguson did not raise on the flop, the only two pair we're really worried about is Jack-5, the only other thing we're worried about is 6-8, I think we have to call with top top here. I mean, if the action had played out differently on the flop, let's say Feldman decided to bet Ferguson called, Hanson raised, Feldman decides to call that raise because it's Gus, and then Ferguson calls behind him. Now I could see if yeah. they check to Gus and Gus bets, Feldman's like, I cannot continue anymore. I should probably shouldn't have called the raise on the flop. I have to fold. But this is really different. 
Gus can still absolutely have a worse hand to be betting for value. He can absolutely have a worse jack here. Am I crazy? Yeah, I think he can. Yeah. Anyway, Chris Ferguson decides to call. He did turn a double gutter, and yeah. that is a normal good call. I hate Chris Ferguson, but whatever. Good I mean, job, Chris. you're allowed to hate the guy who stole $70 million yeah. from all of us collectively, but he certainly is playing his hand well so far. And Gus somehow got a heads up for the river. Maybe he can get it through. Anything's possible. I think he's going to check and then make a decision if Gus makes a big bet or not. Well, let's see what happens. Oh, oh wow. Well, it's the third diamond out there. <laughs> it also completes Gus Hansen straight. But it also gives Chris Ferguson two pair. But there's four to a straight. A six or a ten makes a straight. This is a tough spot for Chris Ferguson for sure, but I think he can get away from this. I mean, the way Gus Hansen has played this hand, would you put him on a ten? Check. Mm, not necessarily, but he could easily have something like jack ten, top pair with a, with a gut shot. I think we'll see a value bet here from Gus Hansen, hoping that Chris has a six or some kind of two-pair hand. I'd be surprised if we didn't see a value bet from Gus Hansen. 15000 15, or roughly. And those are the $25,000 chips. 22, and he bets 22000 Wow. And I think there was no question we were going to see a value bet. Yeah. He was betting with nothing the whole way. Finally, he hits his hand. Why not bet? You know, the ironic part is... I was thinking a value bet would be half or maybe a little more than half the pot. <laughs> he bets nearly the whole pot. Maybe well, he's representing a bluff now. Well, that's the one thing about Gus Hansen that makes him so dangerous. He's so unconventional. Normally when you'd think, okay, value bet time, maybe we're going to bet half the pot. That's exactly what he kind of he kind of throws everything out the window, and he, he goes for it all. And the glasses have come off, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> oh, Mike Mattiso summarizes the situation. Oh, Mike the Mouth said it the best. The sun, the glasses come off. Chris Ferguson got to think this one through. He's made two pair. To me, and you're the pro, but to me, Gus Hansen either has to have a flush or either has to have some sort of a straight Yeah. to bet this. Or air. Or nothing at all, exactly. Or air, yeah. No, Chris Ferguson certainly taking his time with this one. And you know what? You can't blame him. $22,000. There's Melissa Hayden, Alan Cunningham standing up. Everybody standing up watching this one. Well, very excited. We're talking about a $50,000 pot up for grabs. I think this, the, the, the part's confusing Chris Ferguson is the size of the bet. It looks like either air or or a big hand by Gus Hansen, because he bets so much. He bet almost the entire pot. Well, Ferguson's got the black chip in his hand. It looks like he's definitely considering this call. Flip a coin, Chris. I'd be surprised, real surprised, if Chris Ferguson calls here. I think the size of the bet is exactly what's confused him. Let's see. He takes one more check. Yep, I do have two pair. Here's the chip wow. I call. Wow. I have a 10. Your hand's good. And it's a great bet by Gus Hansen. Wow. Can't believe that. Really thought Chris Ferguson would make that lay down. What was the name of that guy who killed Wild Bill Hickok, Jack McCall? They sure. call him the coward Jack McCall. And that is not Wild You're talking about the coward Robert, what's his face, the guy who killed uh, Abraham Lincoln's? Oh, well, he's that a coward. Those are different people. No, Robert Ford. Robert Ford. Well, in Deadwood, Jack they call him the coward Jack McCall. Oh, did they really? Yeah. Okay. So anyway, the point of that is <laughs> the coward Chris Ferguson got what he deserved here. <laughs> he got the gut shot coming in, and he paid it off, and he paid off a big bet. Should he have paid off this bet? That's the real question here, because Gus has to bet once it's checked to him. He yeah. chooses a really big size, probably because he's Gus Hansen. He's like, I can get paid. I'm Gus Hansen. At least there's that that goes with his image. That's pretty nice. Yeah, absolutely. Should the coward Chris Ferguson be calling? I mean, that is one of the big questions. I think the other big question is, how is it that Val Kilmer did not get even nominated for his extraordinary <laughs> portrayal of Doc Holliday in Tombstone? I mean, that was outrageous. He made that movie. No one ever said a freaking peep about the it. Dances with Wolves win or something? Something like that happened? I'm, I'm just talking about it for supporting actor. I just want him to, I mean, how about a what nomination? What about the wolf? Did the wolf win It's support? an honor to be nominated, <laughs> but apparently he can't even get that. It is an honor to be nominated. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? So back to the poker here. Yes, yes. So what, what is the decision that Chris is faced with here? What are the factors that come into this okay. decision? Well, I mean, we, we didn't even talk about the fact that he decided to check rather right. than bet, which makes a lot of sense, by the yes, way. Yes, of course. Because if Gus had raised pre-flop, betting actually wouldn't be the worst idea with our two pair, although probably we wouldn't get called anyway. But in this case, where Gus's range is basically infinite, we have to check yes. as Chris. So I like that play. Now, Gus bets, and Gus is now officially polarized, right? Yeah. 
Like, there's three flush cards, there's two different straights that are very obvious on the board as well, and Gus bets something like 85% of the pot, 90% of the pot, something this like that. This might be the bottom of this polarized range, by the way. I don't know if he's betting the bottom of an end of the straight like this. Even if he is, he's probably not betting 22,000? Yeah. I'm not sure. I'm not right. sure. With Gus, I feel a little less confident. Yeah, I don't what know what he he's doing. doing. I normally don't know what he's doing. But, so. but as Chris, we basically have to be very aware, number one, Gus is pretty much never betting a slightly better hand for value. That's no. good news. He's not betting two pair, I don't believe. I don't think he's even betting a set. I don't know what sets he can have. Although, since he can have ace-10, maybe he can have all the sets. But I don't necessarily think he's even betting a set for value here. He'd be worried about Chris having, like, the bottom end of the straight, mm -hmm. or even the top end of the straight. Um, so I think he'd probably check those back as well. So really, as Chris, we either got Gus because he's just got air, although what air? I mean, he's Gus Hansen, all the air. There you go. The four or five of clubs, you know, whatever. It's not impossible that Gus will show up, will just tap the table and say, nice call, right? Yeah. I mean, it's, it's within reason here. There's a lot of guys that isn't the case for where you could really comfortably check fold. Alan Cunningham comes to mind really easily, right? Yeah. But Gus, ugh, it's such a ugh, spot where of course he can have it. He can have it. Of course he can't. Of course he doesn't have to have it, and right. that's why Chris ultimately calls. This is definitely a player-dependent call. Yeah. The player I used as an example earlier, Johnny Chan, Chris would have definitely folded against Johnny Chan, right? Yes. Like, no question. Easy yes. fold. The straight is kind of weird. Like, Gus has to have 10-8 to have a straight most of the time, or he has a flush that he backdoored. Yeah. But the thing is, it's Gus Hansen, so he can have other random straights, I guess. He can have Jack-10 if he decided to bet the turn with it. He yeah. might have decided to bet the turn there. He can have Queen-10 where he was open-ended and yeah. decided to bet the turn, and here we are. And it makes the nuts, or makes the nuts straight anyway on the river. Things like that. But there aren't that many 10s that make a whole lot of sense. Like Or diamonds. Yeah. Because diamond. the jack is a diamond. That's a key factor in this yeah. hand. The jack is a diamond on the flop, meaning that Gus doesn't have top pair with a flush draw because that's impossible. You would think at some point with a pair and a diamond draw, Gus is going to check back. At some point with other diamond draws, he might check back to realize his equity on the river, especially yeah. when he gets called in two spots. So it's also hard for him to have diamonds. Queen 10 of diamonds, but he already had the straight anyway yeah. with that. So yeah, there's other diamonds I guess he could have. Obviously he can have ace 10 of diamonds as it turns yeah. out. That means he can have other ace X of diamonds. Although would he bet them all the way? Yeah, maybe he would. Ace 8 of diamonds, maybe he just bet that twice. Maybe he would, because he is Gus Hansen. He's Gus freaking In the Hansen. end, that's why Chris calls, right? Because yeah. he's Gus Hansen. And he's just like, well, this guy just has too many bluffs. I got to look him up here. And sometimes it just doesn't work out. I think it's probably the right play. I think Ferguson probably played it right the entire way, which I hate saying, but I think it's true. I mean, this guy's going to win player of the year again. Yeah. And we know that sucks, everyone, because we root for bad things to happen to him <laughs> also. But yeah. he probably made every decision correctly here. And probably most other times, too, when it comes to poker, at least. <laughs> Okay, people, time to weigh in. We did not like Gus's decisions anywhere except on the river. We kind of liked every decision Chris made, although yeah. the river is at least an interesting thing to talk about. Let us know what you think in the comments of Gus's decisions to limp, bet the flop, bet the turn, and then Chris's super tough decision on the river. What do you think? Let us know. We're excited to see what you have to say. Now, we got to see a dirtbag lose a lot of money there. <laughs> not, not everybody who plays in cash games is a dirtbag, but not probably everyone. some of them are dirtbags that were unaware of yet. You can't trust those you can't, people. You can't know for sure. Yeah. And you might get to see some future dirtbags lose a pot if you click right up here and check out all our cash game breakdowns. <laughs> yeah, definitely do that. There's a lot of great hands in there. Yeah. And some non-dirtbags as well, which is, you know, super sweet. Yeah, it's nice to see a nice person you, once in a while. You do get to see Howard Letterer lose money at least once oh, or yeah. twice. So. Equal dirtbag. Yeah, that's good. Um, what else do we have to say? Oh, yeah, check out our podcast. We spent, what, a good 45, 50 minutes talking just about this hand and all the decisions that went into it. That's how we come to these, uh, you know, these ideas and yeah. how we're able to talk about this on our video. It's called The Breakdown, presented by the Poker Guys.